Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students and faculty. Can I have your attention, please? Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we're here uh, very happily welcoming Dr. Howard Spodek. He's the guest of the Lilavati Library. at SEPT University. So uh, we're particularly pleased to have Dr. Spodek here. Uh, in this context of being a center of the study of habitat, what Dr. Spodek brings is a much bigger perspective to the understanding of city. And he's going to talk to us about his ongoing relationship and study of Ahmedabad. Uh, many of you will know about his background in terms of being a, a scholar and um, uh, passionate believer and uh, engagement with Ahmedabad since the 19, early 1960s when he came here as a Fulbright scholar. He is in his own right a professor of history at Temple University and that is his enabling background but he's, throughout his life he's had an attachment to Ahmedabad um, as a, a place that he's returned to and studied and he has a unique perspective on the city. So lately he returned um, to, to study further and uh, contribute to a p publication that he's writing. And we're going to hear an ongoing report as to where he's at at the moment. It's timely also when we're all reading about the controversy over the naming of the city. And although that's not going to be anything to do with his topic of conversation, it helps to put Ahmedabad in our minds and uh, to actually think about the value of what this city is. So thank you very much, Dr. Spodek, for being here. Uh, he'll present his discourse, and then we would like to generate a discussion after that among people who are interested in sharing thoughts. Thank you. I have to thank Arthur especially, because I've been here for a few months, and slowly working through the materials I want to get through, and I hadn't really organized them very well. They were sort of scattered and, and mixed. Um, but when Arthur asked me to give this talk, I now had a point around which I had to work. You know, the 14th of November at 6.30, I was responsible for getting these materials in enough shape to give a, to give a lecture, and I hope that that will work out. What I talk about is work in progress. And I want to, and, so I, and again, Arthur, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I want to ask each of you to do me a favor to get out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and write some notes that you will give to me at the end on this talk. Uh, I'm talking about Ahmedabad, which is in our minds and hearts all the time, whether it's called Karnavati or Ahmedabad. This, this dispute is, uh, I don't want to talk about this dispute. Anyhow, um, the, the, uh, each of you has some experience with this city. And it may be an experience that I talk about in passing or it may be your own experience, your own way of seeing things that I miss entirely. And if you would, at the end of this hour, give me a piece of paper with your, you can put your name on it or not, you can put an email or a phone number on it or not if you want to be contacted, and tell me particularly if there's something that you think I should have included, because I'll be here for another month and a half, two months on this visit, and I do expect to come back next year uh, for six months and continue with this work, hopefully, have something publishable by that time. So your comments would be helpful, and I'm not seeing very many people take out paper and pencil. If you have paper and pencil, otherwise you could email me something if you have your tablets and things there. It's spodak at temple, thanks, spodak at temple.edu. Um, I had already begun to work in an earlier book on Ahmedabad in the 20th century. And I had brought it to the end of the 20th century and even up to the violence in this city in 2002. So when I did finish that book, several friends said to me, Howard, you know about this city. There have been changes since 2000, since 2002, and you're in a good position to write about them. You know the city, you know a lot of the people here, you, you, have, you can talk to people whom you know for a long time in important positions, and you'll be in a position to write something interesting. So I said, okay. I will begin the work that I'm doing this time with the arrival of Kesha Varma and go to the, as close to the present as I can get. And the, the, the focus for what I want to talk about tonight 
is Modi and the city of Ahmedabad, which I really would refer to as Modi and his flagship city, Ahmedabad. And that notion of a flagship city came because of the way Modi has been using the city. And I was most amazed, I think, that, and I'm sure this happened when I was in the United States in my Philadelphia home, um, reading that Modi had asked Xi Jinping of China to come to meet him first, not in Delhi, but in Ahmedabad. And I thought that was really quite remarkable. I mean, you would really think that the heads of state would meet in the capital, but he didn't. He asked him to come to Ahmedabad, and that's where they met. And I thought I would, if this works, show you this. Well, the images that you see, the latest images coming in from, uh, from Ahmedabad, where uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi is with the Chinese President Xi Jinping and uh, President Xi Jinping's wife. They arrived in, uh, in Gujarat a couple of hours earlier on. We've seen the same personal touch which the Prime Minister extended to his uh, Japanese uh, counterpart Shinzo Abe when he was in Japan recently. Over the last couple of uh, hours, we've seen the Prime Minister uh, travel to uh, the Savamati Ashram with the Chinese President, uh, tell him about different parts of Savamati Ashram, present him gifts, uh, quite conversational. It doesn't appear to be a very formal sort of meeting of these two leaders. Uh, Xi Jinping also walking with uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, they are speaking through a translator, but um, uh, lots of atmospherics and uh, it's and, and as you can see both of them are on uh, are on a swing at this stage talking to one another uh, who would who would think for a moment that India and China are at the at the moment uh, in the middle of a, of a face-off in Ladakh where our soldiers uh, are on a, a face-off against each other in a contested part of the line of actual control when the leaders of the two countries uh, are on a swing on the banks of the Savarmati uh, in Gujarat. Um, if this was all about uh, atmospherics and, uh, and all about um, soft issues, then one would say that, that these images would perhaps be the story. But in fact, India and China are in the midst of a fairly contentious phase in their relationship. Uh, India has reached out to Japan of late, an adversary almost. Here's a picture. I mean, I was really quite amazed by this. That this is the reception that Modi gives, that Prime Minister Modi gives to Xi Jinping. Uh, his earlier meeting, if you, you can follow all these on YouTube, you may be familiar with them already, um, that uh, he begins, he meets Xi Jinping at the Hyatt Hotel, I think the one at Satellite, I'm not sure, and then they go to the uh, Gandhi Ashram, where, Mr., where, where Prime Minister Modi and, and uh, President Xi Jinping pay their respects to Gandhi, which must have been a sight. Uh, and then they go to the Hinchko by the Sabarmati to uh, talk about whatever they talk about. Anyhow, uh, Modi had made this his flagship city. He also welcomed uh, Shinzo Abe from Japan in the same way. He welcomed Benjamin Netanyahu from Israel in the same way. Uh, and he's constantly paid attention to Ahmedabad, whether he was chief minister of the state or now that he is prime minister. I think also that he had a lot to do with having, although I'm not positive about this, of having Ahmedabad made a uh, UNESCO heritage city. Uh, it was clear that many of the projects that he works on began before him, uh, and he pushed them along, uh, sometimes claiming them as his own. But in any case, he pushed, uh, he pushed them along. And had you been, students will not have been, but some of the faculty will have been here during the early 2000s when the Times of India Ahmedabad edition constantly talked about Ahmedabad as a heritage city, constantly talked about the possibility of its winning UNESCO recognition. And about 2010, uh, still then chief minister, Modi took that as one of his uh, proposals and ultimately did get through. So he is using this in a very special way. But because I'm a historian and because I really started this project in an era before Modi, I wanted to talk a little bit about earlier times. And I, it struck me as I was talking about this notion of flagship city with some friends that Ahmedabad has been a flagship city before and in earlier times and really very much in the lifetime, well in my lifetime, I don't know about your lifetime, but in the 1960s, Ahmedabad was very much a flagship city 
with the mill owners, the Banyas of the city, the Mahajan of the city, working together, oftentimes the Sarabai family, the Kasturabai family, Amritlal Hargovindas, uh, other families in the city, to bring here many important institutions that were themselves flagship institutions and made the city a flagship. The IIM, except itself, uh, in, in an earlier name, but except itself, the IIM, uh, NID, the PRL, ISRO, so many institutions were brought here, making, many of them thanks to Vikram Sarabhai's interventions. Uh, bringing institutions here. And if you were to look at the city in the 1960s, which as Arthur pointed out, that is when I first arrived, Ahmedabad would have been a flagship city then as well. So as a historian and thinking about context, which is one of the things that historians do, I would say this is not the first time that Ahmedabad has been a flagship city, but it's been different. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences. First of all, the main, maybe the main one is that in the 1960s, what made Ahmedabad a flagship city was the work of its, bunny, of its business community. Uh, they were the ones who took the lead in bringing institutions here, and they were in charge in many ways of the government as well. Chimanbai Chinubai, who was the mayor of Ahmedabad for most of the years between 1950 and, I haven't written down, I'm not sure, 1950 and 1960, um, was the uh, nephew of Kasturbai Lalbai, following his mayoralty uh, when he was, uh, when his mayor, years as mayor were over, uh, Jai Krishna Hari Valabdas became the mayor for another four or five years. So that the mill owners, the, 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 the money people of the city, not only controlled the city in many ways economically, at one point, I, I don't remember these dates exactly, but either Kastorvai or Sarovai employed 10,000 people and the other one employed 15,000. So, I mean, these were people who had immense control over the city and immense influence over individual people's lives. Um, okay, so the city also was a flagship city then. It was made a flagship city by quite different people with rather different interests as well. I should add that these people saw Ahmedabad as their home. Um, Kasturbai saw himself as he was a scion, a descendant of the Nagarshet family, the family that had been the leading economic family of the city for hundreds of years. And he saw that as part of his identity. I mean, that's who he was. So they, they made these investments in the city for themselves, for, the, for their, their, their mills and for their uh, hiring uh, purposes. If you want to hire people in a city, you need, if you want to hire people of, of, of high educational levels and high professional levels, you have to offer things in the city that will entice them to come. And you have to offer schools in the city that their children will want to go to because there are many places that will want these people. So these, were these, these, uh, these flagship institutions were important to the city, to these people, to the, to, to the people who founded them and to the people they wanted to attract. But they came on difficult times. And as I think you probably know, the 70s and the 80s were a difficult time in Ahmedabad for many reasons. First of all, even the, 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 the mill owners were represented by the Ahmedabad Mill Owners Association. Uh, sometimes the Ahmedabad Textile Mill Owners Association. The workers were represented by the, uh, the Textile Labor Association, the Majur Mahajan Gandhi's, the institution that Anasuyas Ben Sarabai with Gandhi's help set up. These institutions were beginning to weaken because the mills, which had done enormously well during World War II, the mills were beginning to fail and they were beginning to lay off people, people were beginning to lose their jobs, the mills were closing, and that meant that the city didn't have much money. The Congress itself, which had been promoted both by the mill owners and by the mill workers, uh, was coming on difficult times. And in, 19, um, in 1965, the Mahagujarat Janata Parishad defeated them in an election, which was shocking to many people. But Indulal Yagnik, the leader of the, M the Mahagujarat movement, uh, successfully defeated them in an uh, in, in election. And there was a lot of criminal activity. Because Ahmedabad and Gujarat have total prohibition, uh, there's a, a lot of scope for illegal activities. Um, the United States experienced this with Al Capone. Uh, if you make something that people want illegal, uh, somebody will come to fill up the gaps. Uh, and that inst those people will, they, they, they are criminals. I mean, and they are going to have criminal gangs to support them. I, I once made a friend of mine laugh. I said, you know, if, if, if you're a bootlegger and somebody owes you money, you can't go to the courts to collect. I mean, your business is illegal. 
so you, you, you have your thugs, you have your gundas to collect for you. So there, were, there was criminality, uh, there was a lot of tax evasion, octroi was one of the main taxes along with property tax, octroi taxes. Do you know what an octroi, how many of you know what an octroi tax is? Okay, uh, tell, the, tell your friends. Uh, the octroi taxes were widely evaded, uh, property taxes were evaded, the city was doing poorly. And then in the 1980s, um, both for reasons of communal violence and because of the calm strategy, the Kshatriya Harijan Adivasi Muslim combination, there were lots of struggles in this city and a lot of violence. F uh, finally, the municipal corporation was suspended uh, briefly and in 1994, uh, Keshav Varma came to take over. Let's see if I, I have a picture of him. Speaking at SEP, many of you may have seen it. I don't know how this works. Um, I brought these on my computer, but the, the connection wasn't, well, didn't, didn't work. I want to get rid of you two all together. Okay, try the first one. Give me Terry Moore. There he is, upside down. Several of you saw him here when he spoke a couple of weeks ago. He was then right side up, and uh, he talked. He talked about he's, the city has prohibition. What can I say? But he was then right side up, and he gave an interest. That's okay. And then let's go to the next one. How do I do that? Just go. To, Should be the next. No, it should be the next one. No. No. Yeah, and he gave a talk in which he talked about some of the changes that he made in the city. And I want to talk about that for a little bit. Um, the the municipal commissioner, as you know, is the strongest executive authority in most Indian cities, and certainly in Ahmedabad. Uh, they come and they go. The usual length of time is two to three years. After that, they usually go on to another city. So their, their impact is a combination of what they are charged with, by the, the charge to do by the state government, um, what in his case, the courts, and, and, and as we found with Mr. Neda and the police commissioner, again, the courts are dictating uh, activities uh, uh, projects that they must undertake or, or they'll be held in contempt of court. They have budget constraints. They have to get along with the elected officials of the city. And, they, and then they have their own personalities and their own ideas of what they want to do. So they are highly constrained on the one hand by the courts, by the budgets, by the elected officials, by the state. And at the other hand, well, they're, they're human beings with their own sense of what needs to be done and how they ought to do it. Um, Keshav Varma had a very active agenda and when he spoke here, uh, how many of you did see him here? Not so many. So let me talk about this a little bit because I wrote about some of the things he did. You can look at this while I'm talking. Varma arrived at a time of considerable despair about the condition of the city. This is so different from the 1960s. I mean, this is the 1990s and it is such a different city in those 30 years. The roads were in such bad condition that the Gujarat High Court had ordered their repair and held the corporation in contempt for its lack of responsiveness. Varma went beyond repair to actually paving and upgrading roads throughout the city in the working class east as well as the upper middle class west. He had crews at work day and night. He ordered an immediate cleanup of the area around the high court, CG Road and Ashram Road, the city's premier residential and commercial areas. He had some illegal constructions near CG Road ripped down. A total of 15 to 20,000 people came out to watch the work. He was very popular. People came out to see the, these, these, uh, this work going on on the roads. Uh, and the, and the uh, encroachments being done away with. On the night of December 1st, 1994, he dispatched 200 trucks and bulldozers to clear encroachments from Sardarbog, a public park at the old city end of Nehru Bridge. While the work was, you know, it's, it, I was not here when this happened, but I was here when Mr. Nehra arrived, and we sort of got this same idea in the newspapers of the way he worked, although I don't know that it was quite as aggressive as this. While the work was going on, merchants in the nearby heavily Muslim Three Gates area began clearing out their encroachments as well. Sensing the new opportunity, Varma dispatched some of his vehicles to push them along. He reported the operation of Blitzkrieg, 
with all of the three gates declared cleared by 5 a.m. When protesters came to his home and threatened to burn down the town, Varma met them with a counter threat, we will bulldoze you. Varma's flamboyant style attracted some, repelled others, and amused and beamed you still others. During his three-year tenure, Ahmedabad's octroi and property tax collections more than doubled. This is really perhaps the most important thing that he did. The taxes doubled, transforming the AMC from an impoverished institution unable to meet its obligations into a proud and solvent corporation with surplus funds. To add to the funds available, Varma's administration floated a 100 crore bond issue in 1997, the first municipal bond issue in Asia. Varma's administration claimed many additional achievements, professionalization of Amdod's cadre of municipal administrators, beautification of CG Road, and renewed and expanded parks and green areas in Ahmedabad, a program to, in, to improve conditions in selected slums with the full participation of the local uh, uh, um, of the slum dwellers themselves and partnership agreements between the AMC, local business houses, and NGOs to achieve many of these results. Um, I want to come back to this later. I, I read that at length because I wrote it, so I, I felt good. <laughs> um, but anyhow, the, I, I was delighted. Anyhow, uh, he did all these things, and the most there are two things I would want to point out about this. The first is that he made institutional changes. Um, the, the changes in the professionalization of the, of the AMC, the change in the collection of taxes, were changes that remained permanent. And he really changed the way the institutions function. Uh, that's critically important when we look at a city uh, or we look at an institution like SEPT. It, how are the institutions themselves coming along? Are they adequate to the task? Um, the, second, the second is that he invited in lots of other people. And as I continue to talk in a few minutes about Modi, this will be a, a striking difference in the professional style and the acting style of these people. Uh, Varma was noted for his expansive style of bringing in the slum dwellers, of bringing in the NGOs, of bringing in the business houses, uh, helping them helping him make his decisions. That is not usually the way the style of, of Prime Minister Narendra Modi is described. By 1991, so the city was recovering. And it was, I, I, I actually should have mentioned this a little earlier, that one of the reasons the city was in trouble, and it will, this will continue, so it's, it's okay that I mention it now, is that in 1991, as you all know, liberalization was introduced into the Indian economy. That meant that business became much more competitive than it had ever been before. So that the new business houses, the businesses that I talked about at first, the Mahajan businesses, the businesses of the, of the mill owners, were highly cooperative uh, as Mahajans. Um, I was told once that uh, when, when uh, funds were being raised for a public project, people would go to Kasturbai Lalbai and say, Shet Kasturbai, how much will you contribute? And let's say he would say, a lakh. And then they would go to another mill owner and they'd say, how much will you contribute? And he would say, how much did Kasturbai contribute? He contributed 100,000, I'll give 50,000. Another would say he gave 100,000, I'll give 5,000. The, the, the community was an organized community with its sense of decorum, with its sense of protocols of how it worked. After 1991 and liberalization of the economy, the business people of the city and of the country, as I understand this, and you may write notes to me saying, you've got to look at this again, but as I understand it, it became much more cutthroat. The businesses were much more competitive. They couldn't do this kind, or they didn't do this kind of cooperative act. You, you found in the old Mahajans that people from one mill sat on the, sat on the boards of other mills. Uh, there was plenty of market. I mean, if you were making textiles in India in the 1960s, uh, there was plenty of market share. I mean, the, you had no trouble selling your goods. So you could collaborate with other mill owners. Um, it wasn't a problem. But after 1991 and with the opening of the Indian economy, businesses became much more competitive and the business classes became much less together. Uh, the other, regu other uh, there were other regulations that were passed. I mentioned that a second ago with Varma. There were the beginning of regulations that were really important uh, to the city. There were building regulations. I don't, I, I, I don't have them written down here, but they are available, and by the time I get to writing this, I'll have the, the names for you and for whoever else wants to know them. Um, th there were building regulations. There were regulations on effluence. There were PILs brought. There were judges bringing, especially Justice B.C. Patel, bringing actions against people who were, dispo who were dis uh, 
disposing effluent from their chemical factories into the water, CNG was introduced. I remember coming to Ahmedabad one year and arriving in the train station, and all the, all the rickshaws had been painted, you know? They were once upon a time all black, and now they were green and yellow, and I thought, somebody, some interior decorator has been at work, you know? But that was a symbol that they had switched over to CNG, which again was one of the big regulations of keeping the city clean. Um, I, I want to mention this also um, because since I've come here in, I guess in July, um, all of these buildings in Odav fell down. You're, you're aware of that, you were all here, yes? There was a group of 22 blocks of low-income EWS, economically weaker section housing, that had been built in 1999, 2000, for low-income people, they all collapsed. They all started to collapse. Some did collapse, and then the government evacu had the buildings evacuated so that they could all be brought down because they were, they were going to collapse, and people were going to die. How do you build a building like that? How do you build 22 buildings like that? What builder did that? Uh, it's not one building collapsed. They all collapsed. They all were ready to collapse. What kind of a builder builds with shoddy materials like that that then collapsed? The city was in serious need of regulations to make sure that that didn't happen and also enforcement. This is a, a, a double hinged area that I will have to look into. Anybody who studies these things will have to look into because um, somebody once said, in, India has Nobel Prize winning laws, but it doesn't have much enforcement. So we have to look both at what the regulations are and how well they are enforced. But this falling down, I went out there, we went out together to, uh, to Odav to, to see these buildings. I mean, it's amazing. 22 buildings, each one four or five stories, uh, and all of them ready to collapse. And, and several did, and then he just dropped. And it's now not in the newspapers anymore. I mean, it was there for a while, and then it's gone. Um, okay, now I do want to get to uh, uh, one, other, one other change that took place is the work of K. Kailasnathan, K. Kailasnathan in building the Ruska Weir Canal help. It turns out that in the year 2000, Ahmedabad was really short of water. Um, and had something not been done, uh, the claim was that the city would have to be evacuated, that there was so little water that people couldn't, there wouldn't be drinking water. Uh, and this was brought to K. Kailasnathan, who was then the commissioner, um, by, I guess, Keshupai Patel, who was then the chief minister, and said, we've got to do something about this. This is a city of a couple of million people. By the year 2000, I guess, four or five million, four million, I suppose, uh, there's not going to be water. And K. Kailasnathan went on an around-the-clock, full-time effort to bring Narmada River water into Ahmedabad through new channels that he built and, and connected. And the, 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 how many of you have heard of the Rusko Weir project? Right. Nobody, I mean, a few people hear about it, but mostly nobody hears about it, and the people that write about it say, you don't hear about it because it worked. And when Amdabadis turned their faucets, they got water. The project was a total success. If that had not happened, all of you would not only have heard about it, you would be somewhere else. So th this, is, this is what goes on, and the, the, the city was in some trouble and they now had municipal commissioners under the direction of the state government that was going to take care of them. Now this is about the time that, that uh, Chief Minister Modi, well, then he's just Mr. Modi, coming from uh, his Pracharak background at the RSS, it looks at, at Gujarat, he is sent to Gujarat by the RSS and by the BJP to kind of save the, the, the situation electorally for the party. It was not doing well, there had been an earthquake in Kutch the earthquake repairs were not going well. Keshubai was the, the chief minister, was faulted for this, that the, the, the repairs for Kutch were not going along well, um, and they were losing votes in local, local uh, elections in villages and the like, and it was felt that they would lose the next election, and Mr. Modi was sent here because he was viewed as a superb organizer for getting out votes. He had, I think you all know this. He had no electoral experience. He had never been an elected official, but he had been a procharak, a propagandist essentially, for the BJP and the RSS for his whole adult life. Um, so he came. Um, he apparently didn't do too much better at cleaning up the, uh, the problems of the 
Buj, the, the Kutch earthquake. They hit Ahmedabad as well, as, as I think you know. There were several buildings in Ahmedabad. The center of the earthquake was in Kutch, but buildings in Ahmedabad also fell down, and many people said also because there were no building regulations. Um, again, I don't know, I'm looking at a very diverse audience. Some of you will know this, just know it, and some won't, but um, the no buildings in the old walled city fell down. The buildings that had been built in the 18, 1900s and before, they were solid. They didn't fall down. But some of the buildings that were new, the nine and 10 story buildings that had been built, they did fall down. So there was a big question again, what were the builders doing? Now there, it, it's maybe more exceptional because you don't expect an earthquake all the time. But from then on, earthquake regulations were introduced into the building codes of Ahmedabad. So here comes Mr. Modi and he needs to win an election. And about this time, as you know, the Godra train incident happens and there is immense violence uh, in Ahmedabad and in Gujarat. The government says about 1,000 people were killed. Other people say, the NGOs and the like, say about 2,000 people were killed. What was his responsibility? Um, the, the answer ranges from he was chief minister, but he was not able to stop the violence. In a certain sense, he was incompetent, but he was new and he didn't know what to do. The second is he did know, but he didn't do anything, that he allowed the violence to take place. The third view is that he caused the violence. I don't want to go into this today because it is an immense discussion all on its own, and it doesn't tell us too much about Ahmedabad, but it does tell you that when Modi, I should add one other thing, that the violence was worst in the areas which in the 2002 election voted for him the most. And uh, there's a dis PhD dissertation from Oxford by uh, Rahil Dativala who charts the BJP percentages ward by, uh, I think election, I think uh, ward, uh, voting booth by voting booth uh, and checks out what the ratio was to violence and BJP presence. When the BJP was very, pro well, was very strong, there wasn't much violence because the BJP was gonna win anyhow. When it was very weak, there seems to have been more. And where it was in the middle, was the most violent, and Ahmedabad was one of those places. So Modi comes to office in, two, now I wanna get him back into Ahmedabad. Mr. Modi comes to office in Ahmedabad in 2002 with an immense baggage. If you like the violence, and there are many people who did and who do, if you like the violence, he's a hero. If you don't like the violence, he's a great villain. But he comes with all of that baggage, and he knows that he has, he's taken over a government that has been in the hands of the Congress for the last few years, and he has to produce. And he begins to produce with some projects that are already underway and some projects that are new to him. But he wants, my friends tell me, he wants visible projects. He wants it known. I'll come back to smaller projects, which I'm also learning about and I don't know as much about yet. But he wants visible projects that will make people say, what a great chief minister, what a great government, what a great political party to do these things. One of them is the riverfront. Uh, the riverfront is not his project originally, and this is true of some of the others, but with the riverfront, it is most evident. Uh, again, as students, at many of you, are, how many of you are students at SEPT? Most. Uh, as students at SEPT, I'm sure you, you have some background, at least, on the riverfront project. Uh, some people say that, that Sardar Patel, the man of the statue, um, began talking about the, the, the riverfront, but I don't know that he had any plans. But by the 1960s, Bernard Cohn, a, a French uh, architect who came here frequently, had plans, and uh, I only knew that he had written about them. They were in a magazine called Amdabad Ma, and where I've seen them. But people tell me he also gave public lectures on this. It was quite well known that he was working on riverfront plans from the 1960s, but they were not very, not very, Full. They were sketches. By the 1970s, uh, Hasbuk Bai Patel, Bimal Patel's father, and a group of others, including Mangaldas, Kamal Mangaldas, and some others, were actually working even more on plans for the riverfront. So they were underway. And by the 19, uh, by, by the late 1970s, uh, there was a plan beginning on the Amabad riverfront. Uh, it was sponsored. I, I'm not sure in what percentages really, but. Um, Keshav Varma had liked what Bimo Patel had done on CG Road and began thinking something more. And 
and uh, Surendra, Surendra Kaka Patel, Surendra Bhai Patel, who was head of AUDA, said, well, this is an AUDA project, not an AMC, it's both, it's really both, project, let's start working on the riverfront. So there were plans afoot to do the riverfront project by the time that Modi came, but they got bollocked up. Different, different political leaders wanted it to go this way or that way or not to go at all. They felt their constituencies would be disturbed by this plan, and so the plan was stuck. Um, along came Mr. Mr. Modi, now Chief Minister Modi, and said, we want this built. And you can see how this ties into the notion of a flagship. When you start, I mean, I start out the lecture by showing Xi Jinping, I, I love it, you know, Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi on a Hinchko at the Sabarmati Riverfront. This became clearly a flagship project. Others that, were, that, he, that he adopted were the BRTS, which had been not really started, but had been thought about. Uh, he made that project go. Uh, in 2003, the year, year and a half after he was made chief minister, he founded the first vibrant Gujarat uh, uh, program, which I think was here in Ahmedabad. And a lot of the investments that he sought, that he sought for, vibrant, for vibrant Gujarat were investments that he sought for Ahmedabad. Um, and in 2005, he swept the municipal elections. I got a picture of that too. It's the next slide, probably. Should be the next slide. That's not it. 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 Now, this is possibly the movie. No, it's not movie. Now you see it, now you don't. Okay. You guys waited 15 minutes for this to start. So. Um, in 2005, he swept the municipal elections in all the big cities uh, of Gujarat, the six big cities, uh, with Ahmedabad especially. And for this, he got many praises uh, for that, what he was here to do. But in doing that, he also confirmed the BJP emphasis on cities. And I think that's is one of the elements that, that characterizes Ahmedabad politics, Gujarat politics, and increasingly Indian politics. 2005 is also the year that the central government passes the JNNURM, the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission Plan. For the first time, the central government, under Congress, for the first, otherwise it wouldn't be called Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, for the first time under Congress, the government is undertaking to look at the cities. Uh, Gandhians were, dis were, were not so happy about that, village people were not so happy about that, but it was seen that the wave of the future in India was likely to be urbanization. I didn't bring with me the, the numbers, the statistics, the data, but I think everybody knows that, that India is slowly moving toward urbanization. I think the national urban percentage now is about 35, and Gujarat is about 43 in the last census, and it continues to rise, and the people who look at the world from above, from Google or from drones or whatever, say if you took in all the peripheral areas of the city, uh, um, uh, Gujarat would now be about 60% urban. Uh, but anyhow, the official rates in 2011 were, I think, 43% for Gujarat State. Um, so there's a shift now toward the cities. And, and Prime Minister, Chief Minister at the time, Modi is both making that happen and, and living with it. It's, it's, he, he's part of making that happen, and he's also a beneficiary of it. Other programs that he begins around the same time, maybe a little bit afterward, bucked up by the 2005 um, uh, victory in the, po in the polls. By the way, I, I want to, let me mention this again because of a con couple of conversations I've had recently. The first people I talked about, the mill owners, the, bu the business people, their currency, their weight was money. I mean, they had power because they had money. They had jobs, they had money. Political leaders' power comes from votes. What makes a political leader powerful is that he can get votes and he can bring along people, as they say in the United States, I don't know whether you use it, people don't have coattails. Do people have coattails here? In the United States, you ride along on the leader's coattails. The leader does very well, and you, you go along with him because he's gonna, he or she is gonna get a lot of votes, I'm with them. And if you're a political leader who can win lots and lots of votes, you're gonna get people following you because you want that vote power. 
put to your use. So this also makes a change in the balance of power between, makes a change in balance of power, who has power, whether it's business people or whether it's government, pe or whether it's government people. I should also add that this is a time when land uh, is, is, land has always been important. It's not that it wasn't important before, but with a lot of these developments, like Sunan, which I'm gonna mention in a moment, and Gift City, there's a real question of who's gonna get the land. The building of Mundra Port, which is outside of this area, the building of the Jamnaga refinery uh, with, with uh, Reliance. All of these projects need land, and the people who can dispense land are government. So the, the, the power that comes to government leaders is dramatically different by the year 2000, 2010 than it was in the 1960s. We have a new leadership class uh, who can dispense goodies uh, and can exercise and do exercise their power by getting votes if they get them, if they get them. Uh, the best book that I've read about this uh, is James Crabtree's relatively new book called Billionaire Raj, which talks about the way in which people, uh, the Ambanis, the Adanis, a lot of others, uh, have made, have, have, have cozied up to, to, to government because they need the land, they need benefits from government, they need, they need various kinds of protection. And the government co cozies up to these folks because they need the money for their electoral campaigns. In both India and the United States, um, the two countries I'm most connected with, uh, the, the, the problem of raising money for an election is immense. Uh, again, I don't have the numbers with me, but they're easily available. The cost of an election in India, as in the United States, is immense. And people need to find that money from somewhere, uh, apart from corruption, because a lot of people say, that you know, a lot of political leaders, including Modi, are viewed as not corrupt for themselves, but they need money for their parties. So there's a huge change in the balance of power, and Modi both helps make push that along and benefits from it. Some of the projects that he builds are summoned. Uh, let me go back first to Echo City, Gift City, um, and Dolera. These are the, I'm sorry, let me put them together, although they're, they're in many ways quite different. Modi begins to attend to the periphery of Ahmedabad. And I have seen very few studies. Gift City gets its studies. Dolera may be beginning to get studies. If any of you are looking for research projects, there you go. Um, these are areas that are in the periphery of Ahmedabad. Uh, they are important to Ahmedabad, and they aren't, Sunand is not that much studied, and Dolera is only now taking off. Modi saw this, I think. Uh, with Gift City, he, he said it began as Echo City. He said, let's make a Gift City. Shanghai is no longer going to function as the economic capital of Asia. It's going to pass to Mumbai, and from Mumbai it's going to come to Ahmedabad. Such was his imagination. He's a very imaginative fellow. I mean, he, he, he sees things that, you know, his detractors say, this is fantasy. His supporters say, someday you wait, it'll happen. Um, I was talking to, to a, a, a former commissioner here the other day who said, you know, Navi Mumbai took 20 years to take off. So let's just wait and see. The, the country is growing, the urban population is growing. There is a place for this to happen. In any case, uh, Gift City was one of his projects. I haven't looked at it on this trip. The last I was out there was maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and there was very little on the ground. There were these two 20-story buildings, mostly of government. There was one Tata building. People tell me that there's more there now, but I haven't been out there. Yes, I'm seeing nodding. There is more. It's happening. Gift City is happening. Some people are nodding their heads. Um, Dolera started, I, I, somewhere or other I have the numbers on this, uh, as, as a new place. Dolera had the advantage of being along this freight corridor um, that is supposed to collect, to, to connect Delhi with Mumbai. So it is an SIR, a special investment region. And the idea was to put an airport in there, which is, I saw in the newspaper maybe in July saying that airport would open in August, but I don't know, did it? Does anybody know? Nobody knows. Well, you know, once in Philadelphia, I asked my students some question, and, and I said, you make that your homework and go home. And of course, my students are much more advanced than I am. They pick up, the answer is 62 or whatever it was, you know. Um, before you leave, you will know whether there's an airport in Dolero. All you have these smartphones and things. So is there an is there, Google, is there an airport in Dolero? So anyhow, there's supposed to be. So this was also one of his plans along the, the Delhi, the Delhi-Mumbai freight corridor. Uh, Sanand, as I think everybody knows, was having, I'm sorry, the, the Tatas were having difficulties in, in, in uh, Calcutta, in uh, Singapore. 
and with, with the workers, with the, with the farmers who didn't want to give up their land for the new Tata Nano plant, and Modi sent them a, a, a one-word invitation saying, you're welcome, come, you know, and they did. So this was his benefit to the city um, with the creation of Sunan and then around it a GIDC, a Gujarat Industrial Development Corporation, system of land procurement and land uh, allocation began. So that area is becoming a major automobile hub, as some of you may know, become a major automobile hub and a major hub for development of the periphery of Ahmedabad, and lots of development on the road going from here to Sunand and to some degree beyond. Um, I want to say one more thing about Sunand. Um, again, it's a special area. Uh, oh, yes, I do know. There are lots of complaints about sun in other areas. And I, I th a, a, as a person who studies history, I want to call your attention to this. You may know it, you may not, I have no idea. But historically, the move from, from being a rural society, historically all over the world, the move from being a rural society to being an urban society has been painful. Um, people who used to be farmers, they can't farm anymore. People who, 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 who had land, they don't have that land anymore. And they don't have the skills sometimes to take up new jobs. In the case of Sunan, the, the payment that was given for the land was in fact very high. But as you probably know, a lot of the people who got this payment had no idea what to do with this money and they squandered it, uh, at least from my viewpoint. And they, they didn't use it to build new, new, new positions for themselves. This is part of what happens it seems to me that has happened in other parts of the world as well, when a rural society becomes an urban society. The rural people are going to move. They're going to, in a certain sense, have to move. Agriculture itself changes, and the relationship between agriculture and the cities change. The people who look at this tend to take one position or the other. Those who look at industry say, at last we are getting industrialization, we need this, this is what we need for jobs and productivity. This is what makes a society great. The people who look at, and, and we have paid the, the farmers. It's not that we evicted them. It's not that we took their land away without recompense. We did that. We, our, conscience, our consciences are clear. But if you look at it from the viewpoint of the farmers uh, and the agricultural laborers, it looks very different. What am I to do, even with this money, Will I get a job? My family has promised one job. We need more than one job. We're, it's a big family. We don't know how to use these new, we don't, we don't know how to adjust to this new industry. And so I think that India, Ahmedabad are going through this crisis and you hear people on both sides saying how wonderful it is that Sunand is here and growing and other people who say, look at the agony that is created for the workers, for the, for the farmers and the farm laborers and people who are accustomed to that. And this will come up with all kinds of development of new industry and new urbanization that displaces farmers. Okay, I want to talk very briefly, uh, there are special investment rules, special investment reasons for Dolera. I'm going, I, we start a little late, so I'll try to hurry up. Um, Modi did some things that were not so uh, visible, uh, and uh, I spoke, I, I spoke with, well, I spoke with people in his administration who really praise him for this. Um, he used town planning schemes, which pretty much everybody here at SEP will know about. He used town planning schemes to reorganize land in the countryside as well as the city. He set up urban resource centers. He set up centers like, at a very simple level, if you go to uh, Law Garden uh, next to the mayor's house, there's this uh, place you can go to get information about the city, uh, to check things on, on Ahmedabad, set up these kinds of things. He set up a Garib Kalyan Yojana, which provided simple tools to people to earn a living. I don't know enough about this. I've been talking to people, but I need more information on it. If you know more, let me know. Uh, to provided them some people with bicycles. This is at a very low level. This is not at the level of, of making sure that Adani gets land from Mundra Port. This is a very different level, and he works at that level as well. At 2007, Octroy is ended. Uh, and the city no longer has an octroi tax, which people again looked at in two directions. On the one hand, finally, we're rid of this bothersome tax. On the other hand, how will the city have control over its own budget? So all of these changes are happening. Uh, infrastructure is being built. Um, uh, E-governance is beginning, uh, bringing the BJP online and, and, and uh, 
e-governance. East Ahmedabad is beginning to develop. Uh, I thank you for that information the other day, and I talked about it a little more. Um, East Ahmedabad, there used to be a time when people said Ahmedabad is divided into three. There's West Ahmedabad, East Ahmedabad, and the old city. That's not true anymore. The, the variety of areas in the city is much greater than that, and the East is much more developed than it was through the building of new roads, through the building of new institutions, um, and to some degree, that's a product, uh, let me go back to this, of, of Modi's pro, uh, chief ministership. I realize, <coughs> as I say this, that I'm making Modi sound as if he's the commissioner of Ahmedabad. And that is one of the issues, and it's going to be one of the issues as we go through this, that Modi sits in, in Gandhinagar as chief minister, <coughs> but he, excuse me, but he looks at Ahmedabad as his flagship city and he wants to control it. And by and large, he appoints commissioners who will carry out his wishes. So that the, sometimes when you get a possible conflict between a commissioner and the state government, presumably the state government wins, but in this case, in many of the years, there is no conflict. That Modi wants Ahmedabad to develop in ways that he likes, that he's designated, and so the, the chain of command, the chain of command between the chief minister and the commissioner is very direct. Uh, I realize I have to say that because it sounds as if he's he is making the decisions. Um, other people have pointed out uh, that his, his inspiration comes from Chandra Babu Naidu, who is doing this kind of thing in Andhra, uh, and beginning to mail, make cyber city in Hyderabad and to modernize and put his emphasis on the, on the development of, a, of, a, of cities. And then Chandra Babu Naidu in 2004 is voted out of office. And Modi reads this and he says, it happened to him. My, my, my way of, of approaching things is pretty similar. I better be careful. And so he, he attends to the countryside as well but I think not as much, and that's something I have to work out. But he's alert to that. I mean, a, as a politician, you have to get votes. If you don't get votes, you don't have power. Um, gosh, I've talked about all of these things. That's good. Um, he begins to work. He, 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 do that, do that, do that, do that. Um, that. The problems. I've made it sound, I think, pretty much, as I wrote this and I got ready for it today, this afternoon's talk, I realized that most of the things I was going to say sounded pretty good, that Modi's work had a lot of benefits. It did have a lot of benefits. Now I want to list some of the problems. And it's late, and I'm just going to go through this list pretty quickly. Um, with the development of agriculture, with the development of cities and agricultural areas, farmers are hurt. Uh, there's displacement of people. Um, and the uh, Narmada River, I'm just, this is a little bit out of order, but that's okay. The Narmada River water, a lot of it goes to cities, even though it was supposed to go to the countryside. Um, there is crony capitalism between the, the, the people who want land and the people who get the land. Uh, he's often called a person who, um, who has brought law and order. The, the state is peaceful. I think that probably that's true, but I think that there's a lot of evidence that that's because of fear. Uh, that, that people are frightened, that there is law and order, but it's because people are frightened. Now, maybe it's okay that governments make people frightened because that's what governments do in a way. But um, if you frighten people enough, you lose a lot of ideas, you lose a lot of inspiration. You lose the sort of thing that Keisha Varma was talking about. You lose people with good ideas who are afraid to express them because they don't agree with the leader's uh, statements. I hear this all the time among my friends the one who writes about it the most is Gunsham Shah, uh, the, the socio political scientist. Uh, he's retired now. You see him quoted a lot. Whenever somebody needs a, a voice, sort of from the left, they go to Gunsham Bai. Uh, you'll see, I was going to bring a newspaper clipping, I forgot. But anyhow, Gunsham Bai you'll see all the time. Uh, the sense that there is fear, and you saw it in this discussion with Ramchandra Guha and Ahmedabad University. I know no more about that than, than anybody else who reads the newspapers. But clearly what he was saying was he was frightened to come here. So this question of law and order, yes, there is law and order, but at what expense? How is it happening? Um, NGOs, I'm told, have been undercut. Um, the, the, this, this is quite shocking to me. I was talking to a, 
a, a younger person but a powerful person in the city administration who came from outside of Ahmedabad and just arrived a few months ago. And he was talking about his impressions of Ahmedabad. And he said, the NGOs are weak. Because I've been coming here for a long time, and you know, this is a city where there's Seva. This is a city where Gandhi had been. There was Seva, a huge institution. There's Saat, there's Sanchetna. There are any number of, of, of organizations uh, of NGOs. So I started to ask about this, and people told me, yes, this is true. In the last five years, the NGOs have been undercut, and they've been under, I don't have enough, I, I don't have, I don't have adequate data on this, but the NGOs have been undercut in two ways. One is foreign funding has been severely restricted, especially if the NGOs were working on human rights issues or civil rights issues. It's been harder to get foreign funding. So that's been one problem. The second problem is that for a long time, governments would use NGOs for service delivery. The government had a project that was to get things to the, to the villages or to the slums. They didn't really have the personnel to do that. So they would contract with an NGO, with SEVA, for example, and say, you have personnel in, in the slums. You have personnel in the villages. We'll pay you to deliver the services that we have to do. And so there was an arrangement between the two. In the last five years, the government, and I do not have much data on this, but I've been told this repeatedly by people who should know what they're talking about. The government is saying, why should we have somebody else deliver these goods why don't we have our own people deliver the goods? And so the government has expanded its, service its own service delivery to slums, to neighborhoods, to villages, and undercut the part of the economic base of NGOs. This to me was a shock. I have not done any, I've not seen anything I can remember in reading on it. Um, but the people who tell me that it's true should know what they're talking about. See me in six months. Um, Okay, I wanted to mention only a couple of other things. Um, the, in, in general, the human development indices under, under in, in Gujarat are low. That's been written about a lot. Christoph Jaffrelo gave at least one talk here about it. That, that those, you're all familiar with that data, yes? That the human development indices, education, maternity, maternity uh, lifespan, lifespan, maternity benefits, uh, young children, malnourishment, Gujarat has a terrible record, uh, not, not Ahmedabad necessarily, but Gujarat has a terrible record of child malnutrition. Everybody knows that. So I don't, I'm not going to go on with it, except to mention one thing about education. And here, um, I'm not going to talk about the Japanese investments. I can't wait, I can't wait to go back and forth. I brought my own computer, but this isn't it. Yeah, leave this up for a minute. Um, I want to talk a little bit for just a moment about education. Um, each person who talks about any political issue sees it from their own vantage point. If you run an NGO, you see it from the vantage point of the NGO. If you work for women, you see it from women. If you work for big industrialists, you see it from big industrialists. I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm a faculty member. I'm a teacher. So I look at things to some degree through the eyes of education. And I was struck. I will try to be finished within the next five minutes at the most. Uh, I was struck by the exodus of people from Gujarat when this crazy man from, from Bihar raped a, a, a little girl, I mean, horrible, and there was a big movement against them. And somewhere between 40,000 and 80,000, I have no idea, but thousands and tens of thousands of North Indians left Ahmedabad. Uh, and when they left, their employers said, we're stuck, especially just before Diwali, who's gonna do the work? And I thought, all I've been hearing about is joblessness. But if there's joblessness, where were there 40,000 people come from? And now they've left, and the employers say, we don't have anybody to do the work. So what it means is not just joblessness, but there's a complete mismatch between the skills that people have and the jobs that are available. And I remembered back to the years when I started to study India, and people talked about educated unemployment. It was a very common phrase. I don't hear it now at all, but I think that's what it is. There's a complete mismatch between the jobs available and the skills that people have. And that, I think, really needs attention. Um, I, okay, I'm, I'm running over, you get the point. Um, I wanna say one last thing, if I got it here, and I'm not sure that I do, I'll read this because it's not that long and I have it on my own computer. I wanna end with a sense of the, 
style of places. There's a new book. I think I've sort of said what I want to say. Uh, there's a new book out. I'll just read this if I have it here. I'm pretty sure I have it here. No, I'm pretty sure that I don't. I'll have it here. It's okay. Um, there's a new book out by a woman named Sarup Dhruv. She writes in Gujarati, um, and she wrote a 600 book, 600 page book called Sheher Nama, which I commend to you if you read Gujarati. Um, even if your Gujarati is as bad as mine, you can probably get through it, it's, it's really nicely written. And her take on the city is going around it, she goes, the, 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 the way in which the book's constructed is a group of people from an NGO go to hear a lecture on, 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 on heritage. And it's, they say, this is a very professional view of heritage. It sounds like a museum. Let's go around the city to different parts of the city and so, see how people live their heritage. Not just what it sounds like in a book, but what, what part of their heritage they really live. And the group of people is quite mixed. They're Hindus and Muslims and rich and poor. Uh, and there's one Christian guy and there are Dalits and there are men and there are women and there are people who've been in Ahmedabad for a long time. In a short time, there are 14 people. And in, all the, in, many, in each of the places they go to, different voices respond to what they see. And toward the, that's my fault. Toward the end of the book, um, they, they sort of reach a conclusion in all of their various voices, all the various voices. And, and, and they give a kind of a moral message, which I think is a good moral message to end with here as well. Ahmedabad now, now has a reputation as a city of communalism, of riots and unrest. By contrast, it's difficult but not impossible to make the case for a city of people living and working together peacefully. People like us have the task of understanding and explaining the beauty of the totality of the fabric of the city. If the common people understand this beauty, the whole reality will be changed, and it can be changed. So when I look at what's been going on in the politics here, um, it's, it's, it's our city. I mean, I, I don't live here permanently as some of you do, but it's our city. And what's been going on, how one evaluates Modi or doesn't, how one evaluates the, the essences of what's going on in the city, depends on, on your value system, really. That's why some people love people and others, they hate them. Depends on your value system. And this call to, uh, to try to find a value system that makes the city beautiful and workable for everybody is, is, an, important, is an important message. There, I, I'm sorry we started late, um, but it's, we have at least some time to answer questions or ask questions. Can I just encourage people? in that sense, to uh, contribute. Encourage away. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what Dr. Spodek is presenting to us, as, as you mentioned, each of us has a particular perspective in relation to this city. And um, we uh, are very grateful for the breadth and depth of your of view. Um, here, with the perspective of our institution, uh, each of you have a particular connection to the city or are learning about being in the city in a particular way. So if I can, with respect to our separate views, encourage people to share thoughts that may challenge or agree with what Dr. Spodek has said to enhance or increase the scope of his study on the city. Now, you can go in an entirely different direction, yeah. too. I mean, yeah. you don't have to respond exactly to what I said. You may have ideas that I haven't thought about. That's why I asked you to write things down. And I will want to collect those. Somebody at the back of the room, please, as people leave, Make sure, don't let them go. <laughs> yeah, so there. My question is about the crime rate in the city, which has gone up, uh, particularly in the last three years. Has, I mean, in your work, are you also looking at that data? I haven't yet. No, and that's a problem. Um, one of the issues in looking at a city at the length and breadth that I'm trying to do is you can't look at everything. You just can't. Um, and I, I, crime, I haven't looked at, but maybe you can write a couple of pages and I'll just insert it right away, right into the work. Also, uh, there's another issue. When I, when I started doing my first work in Ahmedabad, I was looking at the history of the textile mills, and I would read back old newspapers, and you'd say, gosh, the last quarter, you know, last three months, business has gone down. 
and then freelance business has gone up. If you take a long view, all of these things are ironed out, which is why in many ways it's easier to look at something that happened 100 years ago than something that's happening now. Because you can get two or three years that look one way, and the next two or three years look another way. But it's an interesting issue. I, I don't look at it. Which is very unusual in Ahmedabad, has gone up. Both time and economic concerns. Do you know if it's had any effect? And it has a kind of rhetoric of being a very safe city in this sense, not yeah. in communal sense, but generally in this sense that neighborhoods are very safe. However, the data, police data is saying it is not so safe. So that is one interesting fact. Yeah. Sharik? This question you'll be able to answer in a better sense because you also have an understanding of U.S. cities, if I'm not wrong, just by the experience of living there. Uh, what I'm trying to ask is that when I, the most significant moment for me is in 2005, Modi and sort of the BJP coming to power in all municipal corporations. And I see this as a moment when I try to relate with Modi's experiences in the 1970s and 80s when he tours around the U.S and gets funding from the Patil families to build the BJP movement uh, uh, in, in, in the wake of sort of post-emergency era. And 85 is when they win the Rajkot municipality, 87 or 88 is when they win the Ahmedabad municipality for the first time. And there is this sense growing, especially from the 2000s, is that uh, all cities of Gujarat look similar. If there was some sort of difference from Surat to, to Ahmedabad, if there was some difference that's been eradicated and that really is a comment on the suburbanization of the kind he sees in the US in the 70s and 80s and he tries to bring it in Ahmedabad. So you have Thakkar Bapanagar, Nicole growing in eastern Ahmedabad, you have Bhopal, SG Highway, Huma, Sheila, all of them growing in the western Ahmedabad side and you also have a ghetto, a biggest ghetto of Muslims in Asia in Juhapura growing up. Uh, and this really is sort of a suburban experience of living in the US, so, uh, and, and also sort of a middle class capitalist urbanization, which he brings really from his experiences of what he had seen by living with I, the I, I get the question. Yeah, so uh, uh, the, um, I, I, I'm not sure I would interpret either the United States or in India quite that way. If you look at the voting of cities in Gujarat, uh, they don't vote the same way. They did in 2005, but they don't vote the same way. Um, the BJP is stronger in some cities, weaker in others. They're stronger in some parts, weaker in others. Same is true in the United States. Um, cities tend to vote differently than rural areas, but the cities, I mean, New York doesn't vote the same way as, I don't know, Chattanooga, somebody went. Um, they, they don't vote the same way. And, and the suburbs, uh, unless you mean the suburbs of all the cities are different, but suburbs are also different. I, I'm, I'm not sure I, we'll have to talk more. I'm not sure that the data that you're bringing data that I, I don't get it. Uh, sure. so, so just adding uh, from the perspective of the 2017 state elections, we know that had the BJP not won Ahmedabad, Baroda, Surat, and Rajput, they would have lost the state. And this really is about, uh, and, and also Christoph has in, in, in his paper talks about this, that as voters become more urban, they become more conservative and therefore vote for the BJP. And this is particularly true for the Kohli Patils who vote in the Saurashtra for Hardik Patel and Congress and Parish Dhanani, but when they come to urban areas, or even suburban areas like Saran Anand, they vote for the BJP. So I, I think yes, cities are more cities are more. So, so, so in that sense, the sort of what I'm trying to see is that the conservative experience, conservative political experience of Modi, uh, making suburb suburbs in India really draws from his 70s and 80s experience of staying with the diasporic community and bringing funding for the BJP. Let's talk. I, I, I hadn't put that together, and I haven't. Um, it's it's a jump over 25 years and two continents. Um, it's possible, and also conservatism. I, I, we'd have to define the terms because voting for the BJP is voting for a party that likes big cities or likes cities. And I'm not sure that liking cities would be. I, we'll talk about it another time because there are other people too. And you have my phone number. And my address, and my email, yeah. As you said, the 60s had the margin and the textile. I'm, I'm not hearing you. Ah. As you said, in the 60s, the margins and the textile uh, uh, people did something for the city. And 
as time grew, of course, textiles went down. But now, the city has enough number of people, industry, which are doing very well. Do you, I don't see that the same kind of um, giving back to the city is not happening in times today. Do you agree? Everybody or? says that. Yeah. I don't know how I would get the data. And that's what I still have to work on. This notion, you find it in Amrita Shah's book on Ahmedabad and on Esther David's book on Ahmedabad, other books. There's new money and there's old money and the new money isn't so concerned about the city. You hear it over and over again. I don't know exactly how you would marshal data to prove it. It's probably true, I, I'm not saying it's not, but I don't know how you would get the data and I don't know how you would process it. But it, what you say, everybody says it. Yeah, so my question was that why is it like that, was the question rather. But since we don't have the data, yeah, I, 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 I mean, this is what I've been feeling, Yeah. so. I, I can only give you guesses. Uh, one is that the old Mahajans were a Mahajan. They had one industry, and that industry, the whole city turned on that industry. Either the industry profited and did well, or it didn't. Their fates rested with that. So did the workers, so did the ancillary industries. So they came together to, to work on these things. They were also intermarried. They were also of the same caste, largely not entirely, but largely of the same caste. They intermarried. Kastorbai and Sarabai, as you know, were neighbors uh, across the backyard. And, and the Sarabai family gave birth to Vikram, and the Kasturbai family financed him. There were such close ties. And now that, that these are new people who have come, they are new money. They've come in separately. They haven't come in together. They've come in from different backgrounds. And I think the atmosphere that they're in is much more competitive. That's as much as I know. And if you have further ideas, please let me know, because I would love to hear them. Could you stand up so that people can see yeah. you? Yeah, can see him? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, thank you, Seb. I come far away from Bangalore, from Shristi, uh, just for a break to come and visit this. Uh, so my question is Swagatham, Hardik Swagatham. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so uh, being in Bangalore for very long and leaving Gujarat for again very long, uh, think there are things that I've seen and experienced in that city. And what I, I would like to know if you have seen something as such in the city. Uh, that is uh, the thing about belongingness in terms of being a citizen. Belongingness. Uh, because we see migration, and there are two types of migration. You have interstate migration, and then you have intrastate migration. So if, if you are writing about it, or do you have any thoughts about it, what does these two types of migration do in terms of urbanization and to belonging, uh, as in directly to belongingness of a city? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can give you some s responses. Well, have you seen any patterns? Well, I can give you some responses off the top of my head. This, this eviction of so many tens of thousands of Biharis and Upivalas that occurred just recently, I mean, we all saw it happen, uh, indicated that on the one hand, they didn't feel at home. They felt really threatened. Uh, on the other hand, the city welcomed them back. Um, that it was very, I thought, I don't know anything more about it than the newspapers, but it's really interesting. The employer said, please come back here. We don't have anybody to do this work. Um, the government did flag marches, the police did flag marches and did everything it could to say, we'll try to keep you safe. Uh, there were problems, I'm, I would imagine, in the BJP because this is a BJP state and Yogi Adityanath and, and Nitish Kumar are BJ people in Bihar and UP. So that must have been caused an enormous amount of time. But this doesn't, it depends what you mean by belongingness. This is, this is an economic and social need. The fact that 10 or 20 or 40 or 50,000 people would leave indicates that they weren't well integrated into, into the society. I mean, if they had neighbors and all that they trusted and who trusted them, they would say, you know, we, you gotta stop this. One person, one, one woman, one little girl was horribly treated, but you know, we're talking about 30,000, 40,000 people. But it wasn't there. So I'm, I'm just looking at that as a phenomenon. I don't know that anybody studied it. It's much too soon to do that. Um, but this was true, the, the fact that people came from North India to work here was true before. Um, the, the myth of the city is that people felt welcome. I mean, you read that all the time, that people coming to Ahmedabad felt welcome and they stayed. I 
you know, the, in Amrita Shah's book, it's the very, very end of, of her book. Um, it's almost the very end. She interviews a guy who's a, a Muslim weaver tailor. He works with cloth and fabric, and, and, and his shop has been devastated in 2002. And he flees, I don't know, Bapu Nagar, I don't remember. He flees, and he goes to Bombay Hotel. And he tries to come back. He doesn't feel safe. He goes back to Bombay Hotel. And at the end of the book, Amrita Shah goes to him and says, would you ever leave Ahmedabad? Would you think of going back to UP? And he says in her book, why would anybody ever go back to UP? This is my home. So I, 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 I don't know. And I don't know, maybe other people here do know. I mean, I mean that what studies have been done about, and how do you, how do you identify belongingness? You know, a, a person from North India maybe eats meat, whether they're Hindu or Muslim. That, that might make them very unbelonging. I, I, I don't know. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, uh, thank you for the insightful lecture. Uh, the question uh, I had was that, has there been studies, or maybe it's difficult, but on the level of uh, accessibility to the uh, government or the leader, if I compare Mr. Modi, to uh, other uh, earlier chief ministers, Keshu Bhai or uh, Chiman Bhai or Chabir Das, the earlier ones seemed more like people from within, people who knew them. I get, the, I get the question. I get the question. I don't know about other states at all, uh, and I don't know all that much about how accessible Modi is. I met him once for 20 minutes, so I, I must be accessible. That was years and years ago. Um, but I'm not sure that, I, I see, I don't even know how you use these words, accessible and inaccessible. He travels the countryside, he travels the state, he shows up in places where he can't show up himself, he shows up in holograms, uh, he, he sends out masks so that he can be reminded of himself wherever he goes. Uh, I'm not sure what accessibility means. If you mean his mind can't, and I, I certainly wouldn't say he came out of nowhere. I mean, he came out of nowhere in some ways, but he came out of the BJP and the RSS. And he'd been a Pracharak all his life. He'd worked with Advani. Uh, he'd, I, 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 I don't know how to phrase. Some of the problems that I have with the research that I do, some of it is a problem of figuring out what the right language is. Um, what, is, what does accessibility mean? I'll tell you something, this is not to answer your question, but one of the things that I found, it's quite different actually, because the personality type, I don't know. He certainly didn't ask my opinion about anything. I, I didn't mean to say that. He didn't call me and say, Howard, I'm in desperate need of some help. Could you come out here to Gandhi Nagar? I need your, that didn't happen. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what it means by accessibility, but one element that is separate from your question that I have been told is that people who need to access government not the prime minister, not the chief minister. People who need to access government go in different ways. People who have money or education or power, they go to the bureaucracy. They go to the commissioner. They go to the, to the non-elected appointed officials because they have that access. The people who don't have education and don't have money and live in their neighborhoods, they go to the elected officials. I've never studied that either, but that makes sense and, and, and I get the point. That doesn't speak to your issue, which is an issue of personality. I just don't know. So there was a, finally, we get a woman speaking. Yes. Uh, I spoke too soon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk, Professor. Um, my name is Sonia Garvasis, and I'm from Ahmedabad Mirror. Um, so I talked to historian Shireen Mehta, and uh, she, we, we talked extensively, and she talked that, she, she said that, uh, the name Am uh, Ahmedabad, of course, taken from uh, Ahmad Shah Bacha, uh, it comes with its own history because it is a historical city. 
Um, and because of that fact, uh, the city has a history of city magnets uh, kind of being involved uh, in the workings of the cities, you know, constructing, uh, constructing institutions, education. And that the removal of that name would, uh, in fact, erode the history when we change it to Karnavati. W what is your take on it? I, I have no idea how people would, how, how Hindus would react if the name were changed to Karnavati. My guess is that Muslims would feel insulted. I don't know that that's true or not, but there, I, I read the articles, I don't know if you wrote them, but they were in this, all of you should take a look at this morning's Ahmedabad Mirror. There were two pieces, one on, on Makran Mehta and one on Shirin Mehta, both of them saying there wasn't really much, they said there wasn't anything of Karnavati. I'm not sure that there wasn't anything, but it certainly wasn't a, an important city, even to, even to Karnadev Solanki it wasn't an important city. His capital was in Patan. Uh, and it isn't that Ahmad Shah defeated him to take over the city. There's 400 years, uh, 300 years in between. Uh, no one knows where Karnavati was. So I don't get the point of why you would change the name of Ahmedabad, which has been the name since 1411, found and continuously, I mean, without a break, as a city, it's sometimes gotten smaller and sometimes gotten bigger, but it's been here all the time as a major city, uh, called in, in Hindi Ahmedabad. I mean, I've seen people say, the British changed the spelling from A-M-D, but no, I mean, it's the Hindi spelling is Ahmedabad, uh, Ahmedabad, I guess. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get the point of changing Karnavati, except I, I don't get the point. Thank you for the lecture, Howard. I think my question is, uh, you started your talk with saying how uh, Ahmedabad has a history of 20 years of reforms uh, which predate Modi and there was a lot of work which went into it. So a lot of my family lives outside of Ahmedabad and they appreciate all the uh, reforms and urban infrastructure and often associate it with Modi's flagship city. So I think my comment would be, would probably it will be of merit to also present that you know, it's not Modi's flagship city. So or probably also dealing can present a picture that what is Ahmedabad today, the good things, a lot of, you know, it's, a, it's probably leading in a lot of urban development, reforms, planning reforms, regulations, um, more better practices for opening up land, things like that, which predate Modi, even a lot of, so I think whether this narrative about Modi's flagship city, I mean, for me, it's like, in fact, we also need to tell people that it's not Modi's flagship city. It's, Ahmedabad is much more than Modi's flagship city. I think that's just the... Fair enough. It's not less, though. Um, it may be a lot more, but it's not less. He has used it as his flagship city. But I get your point. I mean, that's, it's, the city should not be defined in terms of Modi. I was trying to figure out how to move the historical narrative through this time period, and there is a time when he really takes over. I want to go back to your question for just a moment because who am I to speak on behalf of Muslims? I have no idea. I mean, I'm not a Muslim, and even if I were, I would only be one person. But it strikes me, as, it, as I said, I mean, I, I'm not a spokesperson for anybody except myself. I do speak for myself. Hi, Howard. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, in embracing Ahmedabad as his flagship, in 2002, right after the riots, there was large-scale condemnation of the government of, its, of their handling of the riots. Cut to 2014, suddenly there's a vision of both urbanization and growth that, has been that seems to have been embraced by the entire country. What do you think was one, why do you think that happened? And two, what can you point out as the major shift in our conception of development in that 10 or 12 year period? Um. Most people who have written about uh, Mr. Modi and the BJP have said that he tried to shift the narrative away from Hindutva and, 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 and toward Vikas. Um, I think there's, there are tons of material on that. Uh, and to some degree, he was successful. Um, he said, I'm the Vikas Purush. Uh, and, and, he, and in some ways, he is. I mean, he, he has done a lot of development activities. And he wanted that to shift. You know the literature probably as well as I do uh, on, on this. He was successful. Also, 2002 is 16 years ago. 
people's minds, concerns are different. I also think that all over the world, people in majority communities see the world differently from people in minority communities. People who have been affected by violence. I mean, all these stories that have come up now about women who have suffered assault, and they don't speak about it for five or 10 years. I mean, to them, it's, it, it's shattering. But the rest of the world hasn't even heard about it. So I would think that with Mr. Modi and the violence, if you weren't affected by it, you know, if you're living in, in Prahaladnagar as you were before, or if you're living in even in Kariya as you were before, uh, or, or, or I, 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 people go on. And, and that's always, you know, there are always people who say, get on with it, get on, and, and to some degree that happens everywhere in the world. It's not, it's not just here. Does that answer your question at all? Sort of. You have my phone number, you have my email, you know where I live. Yeah. Is there somebody else? Yeah. Um, if we look at the contribution of the old families, they contributed almost 20 institutions and that led to really calling it uh, Ahmedabad the flagship city. And those institutions had a very different impact on this society as such. And those institutions, whether to do with education, mental health, oh, I mean, there. Uh, cut to the new government when it has, when there's money, there are other flagship projects that are created. Uh, these are of a very different nature. So, what does it speak about the values that are being propagated, or is it a response to society itself? No. Um. Values are the most, I mean, historians love actually to deal with values. Um, we, 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 we look at the past to understand past people, and this is a this big, big comment. We look at the past to understand past people and to understand them because they've lived and they've died and we can see them, and we look at them to understand ourselves. Do we like people who have been uh, imperialists? Do we like people who have been on the side of common people? We find our own values in looking at those values. So I can't entirely answer that question. But when I first arrived, people were very pleased with the, with the Nehru Bridge. I mean, if we were to talk about physical development of the city, over and over again, I mean, I think the Nehru Bridge was built in 1962, 61. I arrived in 64. You see that bridge? That's the, large, uh, the largest concrete bridge in Asia or something to that effect. Somebody else may know more about it. But it was a, a matter of great civic pride. The fact that the west side of the city was developing. There used to be animals running around out here. Now there are people running around out here. That was better. Um, so there, there, you, you heard this all the time. Um, I'm trying to think of the transport routes, trains, the Gandhi Gram station. I, I, I don't remember exactly. But uh, people were not without a sense of pride in the physical development of the city. And similarly, there are a lot of people who are concerned with the new educational institutions that are growing up. I mean, the old ones are still, Amdod University is one founded in 2009. Um, the, the PDPU, uh, the, the NIRMA, uh, SEPT itself is undergoing tremendous changes. So I guess what my social science training would say is disaggregate the variables, that there was also concern in the old days for the physical structure of the city. And the new buildings that were built were, uh, I mean, they were architecturally splendid. Uh, now, I mean, yeah, the values are different. The values are different, but it's complicated. That's, we, we historians like to do that too. It's a great word, it's complicated. I don't care, I'm sweating, it's all the same. Everybody else is sweating, if you can put up with it, we'll just. Hi. No, because uh, these questions are very useful. I'm in the middle of doing this research and writing and you're presenting perspectives that I need to think about. Actually, I should be taking notes and I haven't been doing that. It's all recorded, okay. There's a sentence in your last book that you have written, Ahmedabad had not developed its economy in response to orders from above, 
nor as the locus of colonial enterprises, nor as a branch of office of multinational corporations located in metropolitan centers outside India. I approve. So if, <laughs> if, that ha if Ahmedabad has an independent streak and there is this whole entrepreneur, entrepreneurship behind that whole idea of independent streak, has this, has this have any correlation with the fact that many, even from political parties to uh, from Modi creating Ahmedabad as a flagship to Abdul Latif doing his work in 1980s as a, one of the uh, backbones of his ma uh, ma mafia world. So has entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is one of the reasons why city has been the flagship city in India. Well, it continues to be a really important city for, for, for business. Pharmaceuticals, chemicals, I don't have the statistics with me, but they're easily available. Something like 40% of India's pharmaceuticals are, is that about right? Are produced in Andhra or in Gujarat? Not in Andhra. And not so much in Andhra, but the Mudra port, the Mundra port and the Reliance uh, um, refinery are immense. Um, there is a lot of entrepreneurship here. here. And you know, new entrepreneurship in many parts of the world is called eds and meds, educational institutions and medical institutions. And Ahmedabad is, is a significant player in that as well. Um, you know, the other thing that struck me as you asked that question, because my mind went back, is that in, 19, in 1857-58, the city of Ahmedabad stayed with the British. You know, the people came and said, let's, let's join the revolt from Meerut. And the Ahmedabadi business people said, no, let's not do that. Let's stay with the British. So this question of how you align with politics changes from time to time. Now, under Gandhi, they felt differently. So I, these things change from time to time. I'm not sure this answers your question. Does it? Oh, you need the money. If nothing else, you need the money and you need the spirit of enterprise. You need a spirit that says, we're out there. We want to be noticed. We want to be, we want to, we want to be important. And you need the money. Yes. Uh, yeah. So my question is related to uh, like people's participation. Don't, want, don't let them leave without papers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so question is related to people's participation. So what do you think is, uh, uh, the environment for people's participation in a flagship city, uh, if we compare it with other cities, like uh, I can see there are people's participation more in the planning process and other governance process, but it's very limited in, uh, the platforms are limited actually. So what is your take on that? I think that's true and I don't know. Uh, this is where uh, my, my friends who are connected with NGOs and the like tell me that it's harder to participate it's, it's less free to participate. There are fewer public forums in which to participate. Um, nevertheless, um, there are P I, 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 I'm sorry, I make it sound too dismal for NGOs because it's not. I mean, there are NGOs that work and I could give you the names of people who run NGOs uh, who would be more than happy to have your work with them. If you're talking about political platforms, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, I, I'm not hearing of places where people get together to talk about politics, although I'm sure they exist, and maybe there are people in this room who could talk about them. But in general, what I hear is they're frightened. They, they don't, or, 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 I'll stop there. Bargov? Uh, so my question was uh, related to what uh, Achut Yagnik writes in his book about Ahmedabad being the most segregated city in India, and what he claims about that. and. Uh, I'm also wondering about what the new generation, uh, as you said, it's like 16 years post right? so uh, the new generation would also be a voting generation in like next two years. So how does, uh, uh, in this uh, design of a segregated city, does a new generation think about the city and its past? And so uh, obviously a child from Zuhapura would not be thinking in same terms as a child from uh, Western Ahmedabad. So what do you think about that? And Renaming the city is also about uh, doing away with the scars of the past. So if you change the name of the city, does it also uh, purify the history of the city in some sense? There are more, there, uh, 
I, I don't know how people will vote in the future. Um, I do know from what I've read, partly from Sharik's writings, partly from Charlotte Thomas's writings, um, that people in Jawapura feel a little more confident in taking part in public life. Um, I don't know how people in other areas will vote, um, but you could do a terrific research paper talking to your friends here at SEPT. What do they say? I mean, you know these people better than I do. You're, you're one of them. No, but I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you're, you're, asking, you're asking what the students of today are going to be saying tomorrow. You're one of them. Tell me. Just a minute. You have my phone number, you have my address, you have an email. Yeah. All right, I have a, a question more on the discipline of history. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I have a question based on the historiographical position. And the, con uh, the question, um, the context is uh, the fact that you mentioned that um, there is an overtaking of urban urbanization, overtaking in a kind of a violent form of rural people. Rural people are getting marginalized and, you know, they sell their lands and uh, uh, they don't know what to do with the money. That, that is the fact that you... And so my question is embedded in the historiographical position, like if, is there space to think of our nomadic futures or adaptability as a condition to go forward. I, I mean, look, look at history as how can these societies, which we consider rural or urban, is there any scope for adaptability um, in your thinking about such positions when you say that, all right, rural societies are being marginalized by this, uh, you know, neoliberalism and things like that, is there scope for adaptability? I would yeah. not use the word marginalized, nor would I use the word neoliberal. They don't exist in my vocabulary. Um, but in terms of what happens to farmers when, ag when, uh, when industrial development occurs, there are plenty of historical records on it. it. Is it more adaptable? Yes. I think one of the elements that I see over and over in, in, in studying Amdavad, Amdavad is that people make decisions without considering the consequences until afterward. You know, you declare no parking. Oh, we need parking laws. No, oh, everybody, everybody get some parking laws. Demonetize. Oh, nobody can do any business. There's no money around. Um, I mean, there, it just happens repeatedly that people make decisions that have immense consequences in other people's lives. Without, when we're displacing people from the riverfront, we, we, we give them new, law, uh, new, new housing on the basis of a lottery. That way there won't be any fear of, of, of what's the word I'm looking for, not nepotism, of, 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 of bias. Yeah, but then you break up communities. I mean, there are activities, there are actions that are done that seem to me could be a lot more gentle. I mean, they need to be done. If you're gonna, you, you don't really have to move people from the riverfront, but if you're going to move them, you can be gentler than, than people were. If you're going to get people to stop farming because you're gonna take their land, maybe there's some gentle way, maybe there's social workers who can help, Barack Obama was a social worker. Maybe they could be social workers who could help. Uh, it, it, it just seems that things could be thought through better. I think that you know each one of us, every day of our lives, has to adjust to something new. Sometimes it's major. We join a university, we lose a job, we enter a marriage, a child grows up, a child dies. We adjust in some way. But those things can be made more gentle somehow. I'm not sure this answers your question. I'm sorry? The, the process is going to be a painful it process. Does, uh, in, in, uh, it does answer in parts. Uh, but that's not necessarily what I was uh, seeking, but maybe we'll communicate further You later. don't yet have my phone. You get it from these guys. I'll give it to you later. All right. Thank you, Howard Bhai. Uh, you said uh, 2002 riots, and you talk all about that. But I think it is a continuation from 69 onwards in Ahmedabad. 
which continued in 81 and 83. It may be of any reason, but it turns up into communal. And that benefited the business lobbies of all the communities, because many people shifted from town to <laughs> this side. And today, if you see in the city, there are more commercial things are in the streets, very, very less, many houses are closed. This is happening also in some villages in Kerala, but not this is happening in Ahmedabad. Then the, what you said is, the president, late president Abdul Kalam said that uh, providing urban amenities to rural areas is a solution to miss the urbanization. In all over the country, that is what he said. Bajpai tried it by building the roads and then correcting this thing. But later on, think that no state government and even the central government is pressurizing the state to go towards this policy. This may preserve the culture of the cities which are which they want. Now it is only heritage, there are houses are there, you will know. But the, all the culture in the city has changed. You should talk of Mahajan, that was a community, the streets were of one community, there were one Mahajan. There were elites. Oh, I'm sorry, what's the question? You, you're no, asking? My question is not that. What I'm saying is, you talk about what is the changes going on in Amrabad from now to today. Right. I'm, I'm not questioning you. And the... <laughs> and my last point, uh, which I was saying, that uh, more and more villages around Amrabad were brought under a town planning scheme. And the, any, any government, of irrespective of any party, I have to have a party list or caste list or anything, they are not able to control it. They are not able to make it proper use of it. Not able to bring for proper amenities. You bring the area, you make the bill area, and then other things goes on. And, I, uh, yeah. and because the elites, formally you said the elites, politicians are dependent on the elites. Now politicians are dependent, elites are dependent on politicians. Yes. This is another change. Okay. Yes. By the way, I, I have read, and I, I don't have data on it at all, that, that uh, Prime Minister Modi is talking about urban, urban, R U R B A N, urban development, bringing urban facilities to the countryside. I've seen references to it, but I have not yet read more about it. I think, yeah, we should. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Yeah. So, on your behalf, may I thank Dr. Spodek for coming and challenging us and pushing our boundaries of understanding and of knowing what a city is about, such that we generated a wonderful discussion, I think, that may be of help to him. So on behalf of the Lilavati Lalbai Library uh, lecture program at SEPT University, thanks to Dr. Spodek and thank you for coming.